The Threadripper 2950X is an incredibly impressive chip. If you haven't seen my standard review of it, then go check that out to see more about the chip and its stock performance. But in this video, we're going to cover a couple of different topics. First off, how to overclock a Threadripper 2950X. Second, what the performance results are like. And third, what motherboard you will need to do so and just how immense of a motherboard this Zenith Extreme board really is. So let's jump into it. First things first, on actually overclocking it, it is as simple as overclocking any other processor. In my case, I'm using, as I said, the Zenith Extreme motherboard, which is a very, very high-end board. It's incredibly expensive, but has a lot of features, is incredibly beefy, and is overall just pretty impressive. When you're in the BIOS, all you do is set your core speed to, or the, your core multiplier ratio to whatever you want. So in my case, I set it to 42, so that it's 4.2 gigahertz all cores. And then you set the core voltage. In my case, I set it to 1.4. Four, five, and I also set the SOC voltage, the chipset voltage, to 1.1 for a bit of extra stability. And otherwise, uh, the RAM is a 3200 MHz kit, so that was set by the DOCP profile, but otherwise, that was it. Now, in terms of actually testing it, I was actually still using the uh, Coolmaster Wraith Ripper cooler. That's the air tower cooler, it's sort of dual heat sink kind of thing. It's, it's a beast of a uh, thing. It actually looks quite cool, too. Uh, and while I did get up to, I think, 86 degrees degrees Celsius under full load with a, a large number of stress tests going on. Um, it still held up just fine. In terms of temperatures on the VRMs, they actually only hit, I think, 57 degrees Celsius, which for VRMs is incredibly cool. This board is just an insane thing that can tank anything, and even the 2990WX, which is obviously the 32 core, I expect you could probably overclock that on this board and still have room to spare on those VRMs. In terms of the performance, let's take a look at the different results. So starting with Cinebench, we're looking at 3,524 points and the same single threader results as the chip itself boost to 4.2, 4.4 uh, on single core anyway. So that was still 176, I believe. Uh, but that, that single threader, that multi-threaded result is 400-ish points more than the stock results. So that is a important impressive gain when you're looking at the difference. In terms of 3 Mark Firestrike's physics score, this is again an incredibly impressive result at a little over 29,000 points, which is about 2,500 points more than the stock result, which again, in terms of a percentage difference, is a good improvement. Now in terms of the more real world testing, Blender was actually a pretty much identical run. I'm not too sure why this is, it may just be because the Blender workload at stock was able to also OC all of the cores to a pretty similar point, but nonetheless, it is still a very impressive result at two minutes and 32 seconds or 152 seconds overall. Um, and in terms of Premiere, this is where it gets really impressive. Uh, this chip at 4.2 gigahertz was able to do the same uh, Ryzen Gen, uh, Ryzen second gen unboxing video render in five minutes-ish, I think like five minutes and 22 seconds or something like that, uh, rather than the eight minutes and 22 seconds, which is actually, incredibly impressive uh, and is just uh, very very cool. In terms of gaming there really isn't any difference in the results and I will throw the numbers up for you but they're exactly the same as the ones from the standard review so I really wouldn't worry too much about that. I would still mention that GTA 5 did seem to have issues. I'm not sure whether this is because of the GPU that I'm using here which does seem to have a few issues and crashes things like PUBG on and also had some artifacting and other issues so it could be that. It could also be that GTA just doesn't like this number of cores and you can use the AMD Ryzen Master Utility to drop the number of cores or disable eight of them so that it's running in an eight core mode and that will be almost identical to a 2700X, I would assume anyway. Uh, and otherwise, as I said, this is just a, an incredibly impressive chip in terms of its real world synthetic and gaming performance. And finally, while well, we have mentioned it in the video so far, here, sort of here and there, the Zenith Extreme motherboard is a behemoth. It's incredible incredibly expensive. It's possibly one of the most expensive motherboards available, at least on the kind of consumer side of things anyway, at the time of filming, and is kind of insane. While I haven't had my hands on this before, and I haven't done a full review, there are plenty of other channels who have done excellent jobs at re 
reviewing this very well so go take a look at those if you fancy an in-depth coverage of it but I want to run you down a few things that kind of few features that the board has while we're here. Now, of course the main thing is the VRMs. This board can handle the 2990WX even with an overclock with no issues. In terms of as I said my testing the VRM temperatures were only 57 degrees celsius which is incredibly impressive when it comes to VRMs and throwing nearly 500 watts through them. The board comes with a dim dot 2 slot which is ASUS's kind of proprietary way of adding what looks like an extra RAM slot but is essentially just PCIe lanes so you have two M.2 drives on either side and then you have a couple of temperature probe sensors at the top. This is awesome to see. It's actually a really interesting form factor and potentially allow for extra features and upgradability and extra add-in DIMM.2 cards in the future, which could be pretty interesting to see. You also even get a 10 gigabit networking card in the box. This is a 10 gigabit ethernet one, which is their RG Aerion 10G. Uh, either way, it's an incredibly impressive little 10 gig card. And while the board itself obviously doesn't have 10 gig built in, it's great to see this included and while obviously this is an incredibly impressive card, if you do want to add some more 10 gig support because you do have 64 PCIe lanes total available with the Threader, Threadripper chips, then you can go pick up another one of these, something like the ASUS XGC100C, which is actually pretty cheap, will work with, uh, you know, connecting to your Arion card if you fancy, and it's just, you know, awesome as well. You do also have an M.2 slot hidden under the chipset heatsink, which actually in and of itself looks awesome awesome has aura sync rgb built in as well as the aura sync strip on the right hand side of the board which again just looks really nice and adds a very nice aesthetic to the, the board as well uh, and while i would mention that you have a load of pcie support you have four x16 sized reinforced slots and all of them either run at x16 or x8 so again very impressive and you have a couple of open back x4 slots as well so again a lot of options available in terms of the rear io you have a full set of audio outputs which actually have LEDs inside them to show you which one is which. You have obviously your gigabit ethernet and you have a load of USB 3 type C and 3.1 ports as well and you have some killer Wi-Fi on board uh, which again is, is pretty impressive to see. And I think the only other thing that I want to mention with this board is just the little display that's built into the rear IO housing or the cover. It's something that you can see from inside your case and is basically just a little debug display. It's a little sort of almost 8-bit kind of look thing um, and has a lot of your debug information actually gives a lot more information than your standard sort of double seven segment display debug LED as it tells you which part you know it's testing so whether it's testing the CPU your graphics card your hard drive or anything else and it can display error messages including you know other stuff so it's diagnostic information um, that you don't necessarily have to go and look up every error code in the manual which is actually really awesome to see so there you have it that is a thread ripper on how to overclock it, its performance results, temperatures and all that sort of stuff, and a bit about the Zenith Extreme motherboard as well. If you have any questions on any of these points, then let me know in the comments down below. Are you interested in a Threadripper 2950X or a Zenith Extreme motherboard, or is this way too far of your price range and you're sticking with the like the Ryzen 3s or whatever? Let me know in the comments down below, I'd love to hear from you. If you'd like to pick up a Threadripper 2950X or the Zenith Extreme motherboard, I'll leave links to each of them in the description down below. I'll take you to your local Amazon store where you can see pricing when and where you watch this and buy one if you fancy. If you want to support the channel and keep me making these videos and testing awesome stuff like this, then you can take a look at the links in the description. There's a Patreon link where you can support me directly or Amazon and Overclock UK affiliate links, which again, when you click on this play, you know, click on those links before you buy stuff, it massively helps me out. You can also check out the merch store, which sadly I'm not wearing one, one of the t-shirts today as it's in the wash, but uh, they are actually really pretty nice. You can pick up a number of different designs as well. There's stickers, hoodies, and lots of other stuff. So you can take a look at that. And uh, yeah, otherwise, if you've got any questions, leave them in the comments down below. Check out my other videos over here, including the Threadripper 2950X video. And we'll see you all in the next video.